I thought some practical tips on protein labeling might uh, interest people. Usually with thiol labeling, we're aiming to get a probe in just one place on a protein. So you may be lucky and have a protein that has a naturally reactive cysteine, like, like actin, for example, which has one reactin uh, near the um, C terminus. It's getting more common now for people who really want to study a protein in detail for biophysics to actually engineer out all the surface exposed cysteines and then engineer in at one place a reactive cysteine. So that's some amount of work on the cloning, uh, but can be wor worth it. And you can actually walk a fluorochrome into different places on the molecule, by, depending on where you put the cysteine. Now, it's really important to protect your cysteine until you do the labeling. So you want to include reducing agent in all the buffers until the labeling step, and then remove your DTT or, or beta mercaptol ethanol in the last step, or else titrate it out with probe. Cysteine labeling is typically down at pH 7 to 8. If you go too high in a pH, you uh, risk labeling um, tyrosine residues. You don't, the nice thing about these cysteine probes, these iodoacetate melamides, is they're not very reactive with water, so you don't need to use very much. Just enough, essentially, 1.5 to 3 equivalents is typical. And because you're not using very much, you have to react uh, uh, for a long time overnight at room temperature. So these are kind of cookbook uh, 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 recipes. With the typical lysine labeling reaction, where you're not usually aiming for site-specific, um, it's, it's, um, the consideration is a little bit different. There's plenty of surface uh, 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 lysines on most proteins, so you can often want to label several of them. For example, on an antibody, you want to, might want to aim for about four fluorescent molecules per antibody. Usually the antibody will still be fine and you get plenty of fluorescence then. Uh, these NHS ester probes, unlike the thiol probes, they're quite chemically reactive. It's important to store them in a high quality dry solvent. DMSO is the most common or, or dry um, in the freezer. We often aliquot them in DMSO and store them at, at minus 20. You want to label at neutral pH or above. Uh, you want to use a non-nucleophilic uh, uh, buffer. We often use HEPIs in my lab, uh, bicarbonate, borate. Important not to use DTT or thiol. I mentioned they'll decompose the probe. The issue with the pH is this. The, the higher you go in pH, the faster you'll react with the protein, but also the faster the probe will be, de be decomposed by hydroxide ions. And um, in our experience, it often actually works a little better at, let's say, pH 8 than it does at pH 10, because you, you start getting too, much, too rapid hydrolysis. And just as a rule of thumb here, these NHS ester probes their half-life in solution will be a minute or two at pH 9 and, and several uh, hours at pH 7. Well, about an hour or something at pH 7. So if you do a pH 9 reaction, it's all over in an hour or something. If you do a pH 7 reaction, you may want to leave it overnight, uh, say, at 4 degrees. Now, if you want to control the stoichiometry, you don't want too much label. If you overlabel a protein, it may crash out of solution or, or be non-fluorescent. With the thiols, you usually do this by stoichiometry, so you add 1.5 moles per protein, or, or, or not too much anyway. With the amine reactive probes, because they're hydrolyzing, you're often controlling the reaction not by the stoichiometry, not by so, much, so many moles per mole of protein, but rather by concentration. But in practice, whether it's more stoichiometry limited or more concentration limited depends on the concentration of your protein, and so you may have to... Um, pilot it. The good news about uh, uh, reacting tough proteins like antibodies is, is it turns out um, they'll accommodate a fairly wide range of protein density, so it's actually fairly uh, easy to get a, a good labeled antibody. Uh, a few other practical points. Your protein may have some essential cysteines or lysines. Uh, I've spent half my life working on the molecule tubular, and it turns out if you take tubulin dimer free in solution, it has highly reactive cysteines and lysines that are essential for its polymerization function. And there are some tricks for protecting those. So you can sometimes sterically blockade uh, essential cysteines or lysines by having a high concentration of a physiological ligand that blocks access uh, of the labeling reagent. So for example, in the case of tubulin, you have to label in the polymer. So if the tubulin is polymerized into a microtubule, that actually protects these essential groups. And sometimes with an enzyme, you can protect by having a, a, a high amount of substrate that protects the active site. I think my final uh, practical point is separating free probes from protein. Traditionally, you do this by molecular size, by dialysis, which is kind of slow, or by gel permeation chromatography.
With these modern dyes with the sulfonate groups, that works quite well, but if you have a more sticky dye, it often will stick to the protein and be hard to separate, and it's useful to check how much is left by uh, chromatography on silica gel. Uh, increasingly, in my, my lab, we like to use an affinity-based method, labeling either in solution or first attaching the protein and labeling it on a column. So, for example, with antibody labeling, we're often attaching the protein to a protein a, the antibody to a protein A column, labeling it on column, flushing away the excess, and then eluting the antibody. And that seems to work really well and give us very little uh, free dye.